Tags are on the bulletin board. It's in the lobby. Fun one here, chili supper cook-off. Eric Helton, where are you? If you're here, be careful. His chili will put holes in your stomach. Um, chili supper cook-off, Saturday, February 10th, 6 p.m. There's a sign-up sheet in the kitchen. Always a very fun event. Elderberries uh, is... Um, <clears throat> For those who are 60 years or plus of age, you are, if you're interested in this group, please meet for a brief meeting this Sunday uh, morning after worship. Uh, the next Connect group meeting that we're going to have is going to be a, a couple of weeks out. That's on um, Sunday, February 11. The ladies' Bible studies, uh, Tuesdays at, uh, or at uh, February 13 at 5.30. Men's night is the third Thursday, and that's going to be February 15th, and um, Bible study in Potluck 630 here. Also, we have a family retreat March 1st and 2nd, and uh, this is a very new event. I want to encourage everyone to sign up for this, March 1st and 2nd, going to be held at Rolling Hills Bible Camp, and um, details on that, you can, you can see Realm, or you can see, uh, check out the bulletin, but that's going to be a Friday Saturday event starting 6 p.m. on Friday. Sign up is on the kitchen counter. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> any more um, any more announcements that we need for tonight? Any other ones we have? Okay, <clears throat> let's go to God in prayer. Our holy and eternal Father. The great I am, the beginning and the end, we humbly come before you as, as your children. We want to thank you, God, for everything that you have given to us. Thank you, Father, for, for guiding our ways, and, and we pray that we would continue uh, to look for your guidance in all that we do. And, Father, it's one thing to say that we want to learn your will. It's another to want to live by your will and help us all the days of our life to never quit learning and to always seek to understand what you want us to do in our lives and be a shining light for you individually and as a church in Richmond as that city upon a hill. Father, we, we thank you for the elders here. We thank you for the deacons and the preachers and, and on all the members, Father, and we ask your blessing on all that we do. Father, tonight we want to ask uh, you to please watch over us as we begin this period of, uh, of, of, a, of a worship and then we go into our Bible studies that we can study your word. Please watch over all those who are ill. Watch over uh, Felina Pear who um, has gone through recent surgery and there's so many, Father, but please especially be with the Pear family at this time. We ask your blessing also on all those who have lost loved ones. Thank you, Father again for watching over us this evening. And it's all in your son's name that we pray, amen. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious reed.
A few years ago, I got to go to a friend's family farm and spend the weekend exploring and seeing a brief window into farm life. I got to pet and feed horses, roam over acres with two of the most lovable and friendly farm dogs I have ever met, Bo and Daisy, and see cattle up close and personal. The weekend was extremely relaxing and fun as I have never got to visit a working farm before. With that being said, I expected the weekend to be leisurely, but I wound up having a really profound spiritual insight over the weekend that has helped me in my spiritual walk. It is this insight that I would like to share with you in the hopes that it helps you as well. It was a Saturday morning and our group had a fantastic home-cooked breakfast when my friend's father, who was the owner of the farm, wanted to show us his cattle and let us get our hands dirty with a little farm work. We all grabbed our coats and boots and headed out to see what was in store. With Bo and Daisy leading the way, we made a quarter mile walk to where the cows were and entered a giant pen that was designed to let cows in and out of the fenced area where they were kept. That is when the owner asked if anyone would like to wrangle a calf so it could be tagged. One of the women in the group jumped at the chance and this is when I had a profound and rather hilarious insight. The owner showed her how to rope the calf and then it was on. It took her a few humorous tries, but she eventually was successful at catching the calf, much to the applause and laughter of the group. The insight of this moment, however, came not from the actions of roping the calf, but the reaction of the calf at what was happening to it. This calf was not being harmed in any way, but the calf was scared, defiant, and confused at what was going on. It was separated from the herd and pleading for its mother. The mother was not too thrilled watching its offspring headbutt and fight to try to get away. This calf was literally struggling and fighting because everything in its environment in that moment was completely out of its control. Even the actions of roping the calf were necessary for its own benefit. The calf had no knowledge or way to understand. It was reacting purely out of an instinctual need to return back to the familiar and comfortable. In that moment, watching the calf fight and struggle against something that was for its own benefit, I couldn't help but see the parallels of moments in my life where I have responded the same way. This helped me to understand God a little bit better. How many times do we have 20-20 hindsight? Where we experience something uncomfortable or downright scary and walk away years later to understand better what was going on in the moment. I wonder how often God has this experience with us, the patient father forcing us to be uncomfortable all so we can grow and develop correctly. This knowledge pointed me to the Proverbs chapter three, verse five, and the word says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, do not depend on your own understanding. I like control. I like to be in control. I don't like to have life or events shatter the illusion of control. When I watched that calf, I couldn't help but see myself fighting, struggling, headbutting just to get away when in fact what I needed was what was making me uncomfortable. It really put into perspective for me that comfortability cannot be the goal in life that inconvenience cannot be averted at times and it shouldn't be. That sometimes life throws you a monkey wrench that you can't see coming and you have to deal with it. It also showed me that sometimes it is best to go with the flow, to not overreact at every little thing that comes my way. If that calf hadn't put up a fight, the entire event would have taken literally seconds, but instead it was a whole dramatic ordeal. I reflect on that moment and laugh at myself I can't even begin to tell you how many times I am like this calf and how frustrating that can be. I like to think that God face palms, me, face palms at me quite a bit, which is pretty funny. What I learned most from this moment was that I don't always know what is best for me. To trust my father that he isn't leading me down the wrong path and that if he is doing something that is uncomfortable or confusing, that I should trust him instead of bucking up against him. 
giving up control to God is one of the hardest and most difficult challenges that I struggle with. But if that little calf has anything to show me, it's then I need to trust my father that he is doing what is best in my life. If you are like me and struggle in this area, or if you are in need of any other help, uh, please come forward as we stand and sing. Oh, how sweet it will be to me, the Lord, when he comes in glory by and by. What a song of praise will be outpoured when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet it will be, how sweet it will be, when he comes again in the sky. Test. I just learned. <laughs> I just learned. Okay. David Pear just posted it, I think, but Felina's home. He's doing his class to Guyana tonight. Things appear good. Uh, number two, I, I didn't follow up on this, and I just found out today. I should have known two weeks ago, but some of you who were here many years ago, remember Melvin Masters. Well, he passed away. He had a heart attack and passed away on the 14th. Uh, so it not, he was in the hospital and had surgery is what it was. And then he 
didn't come out of the anesthesia. That's what it was. I just found that out today. I'd followed up finally. So, Also, next Wednesday for four weeks, just the month of February, and I'm going to get it wrong, I guarantee you, Holy Huga. Don't ask, because I don't know. Holy Huga is going to be a class for ladies for four weeks in the library. So any of you that would like to go and be a part of that, uh, the first week the room will be full because everybody's going to go and figure out what holy huga means. After that, you'll stay because the material will be outstanding and the teachers are lovely and wonderful. So if you want to be a part of that, starting next Wednesday in the library. Okay. Robert Jeter is on. Thank you, Mike. No problem. What makes for a good apology? If somebody wanted to apologize to you for a slight, what would it take for it to be successful? What are the ingredients for an effective apology? I thought a lot about this over the past couple of years, and I think my growing awareness that my personal apologies need some improvement strangely seems to coincide with getting married. I'm sure that's just a coincidence and it has nothing to do with each other, but uh, what is it that makes for a good apology? There's a few things I've found that are more frustrating than realizing you're wrong, wanting to apologize for being wrong, and the apology turns out to go wrong. So I think we can all agree that sincerity is a very important part of apology, a genuine sense of sorrow. If we don't seem to mean what we're saying, if we are just flippant about the harm that we've caused, if we're just going through the motions, I don't think our apologies are going to be taken very well. Here's a quick little story. From when I was little, there, there was a, uh, a state trooper that lived on our street. And he would just fly down through our neighborhood all the time. And uh, there was one day that my brother and I were out there playing in the front yard, but our cat was out there with us. I think you can see where this is going. One day the neighbor goes zooming by, no lights flashing, no sirens blaring, and he runs over our cat. And of course we're devastated, we're horrified by what we had just witnessed. And our neighbor turns around, slowly makes his way back in front of our home and with me and my brother just in tears. He didn't even bother to get out of the car. He just rolled the window down and goes, sorry, and drove off. That wasn't a very effective apology for us. Um, obviously, I've remembered that for a very long time. Uh, it didn't seem very sincere to us at the time. It turns out I've learned that just saying I'm sorry doesn't actually heal any pain. It doesn't heal any pain at all. Now, I know that there are some relationships that are so starved for understanding and so filled with pain that just a simple I'm sorry seems very transformative and powerful, but I think that's just because it's the best place to start. Okay, it gives us an opening. So, I think healing can only start to be, uh, can start to take place when we learn to communicate that we understand the significance of our actions. When we show that we genuinely care about the feelings of those we've wronged and we can start to validate their position. So we need to be genuine, yeah. We need to focus on the feelings of those we've wronged, yes. But, but uh, we should avoid using caveats and qualifiers in our apologies. If I said to you, I'm really sorry, but, well, I've just ruined the entire apology. Um, I'm a fairly rational person most of the time, and uh, if I try to rationalize why I hurt someone to that person while I'm trying to apologize to that person, well, I'm not trying to, to heal the pain that I've caused them anymore. I'm more focused on myself and making myself feel better about what I did. Psychologist Harriet Lerner wrote the following, and I quote, an apology isn't the only chance you ever get to address the underlying issue. The apology is the chance you get to establish the ground for future communication. And I think that's really well said, and another way to say that is, an apology is an opening. And if you do that opening with attention and care, 
it becomes a conduit where, where you can have greater understanding of one another, you have an opportunity to form deeper connections with one another. But as difficult as apologizing at times is, the most difficult part and the most important ingredient in a good apology is repentance. What steps am I taking to ensure that it doesn't happen again? Well, tonight we're focusing on prayers of repentance, and we're going to start in the book of Jonah. So the story of Jonah is probably pretty familiar with everybody. God calls the prophet Jonah to go rebuke the people of Nineveh because of the great evil practice there. But Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh, so he gets on a ship and goes in the complete opposite direction. Now, in uh, response to Jonah's rebelliousness, God causes a tempest to rise on the sea, which threatens the lives of everyone on the ship. And while the mariners are fearfully calling out to their gods, throwing the cargo off the ship to try to lighten the load, Jonah is sound asleep in the belly of the ship. Now, the captain finds Jonah sleeping. He rebukes him and commands Jonah to call out to his God as well in hopes that they might all be saved. But eventually, all the clues point towards Jonah as being the cause of this calamity. So the men begin to ask him, who are you? Where are you from? What is it that you do? Well, Jonah's answer doesn't comfort them very much. Jonah tells them, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the land and the sea. Well, this only makes them more fearful. They've inevitably heard many stories about the power of the Lord. And uh, the sea continues to grow even more tempestuous. So the men plead with Jonah, and it's remarkably similar to the Jews in Pentecost talking to Peter, saying, what is it that we should do? Well, knowing that this tempest came about because of Jonah, Jonah suggests that they pick him up, and like the rest of the cargo they've already thrown overboard, they throw him into the sea as well. But the sailors, interestingly enough, are not interested in killing Jonah, so they desperately make one more attempt to make it to shore, but they can't get there. Then the sailors do something really remarkable. They pray to God, saying, O oh Lord, let us not die on account of this man and don't hold us guilty for his death. You are Lord, and your will be done. So with no other options before them, they hurl Jonah into the sea, and immediately the sea is calm. The sailors who began this ordeal by praying to their gods have come to fear the Lord, the living God, and make vows to praise and offer sacrifices to him. So chapter 1 ends with a very memorable verse. It says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So in chapter 1, we are invited to compare the defiance of God's prophet Jonah, who seeks to separate himself from the presence of God, with the pagan mariners who ultimately seek to do the will of God. It's a remarkable uh, comparison to see the contrast of Jonah, who's found sleeping in the bowels of the ship, unmoved, unconcerned with the potential death and destruction that he is going to cause these innocent people and these sailors who make every effort to save Jonah's life. But before we get into that, why didn't Jonah just go to Nineveh in the first place? Why did he go in the complete opposite direction from where God sent him? Well, when God says that there was great evil practice there, he wasn't kidding. If you go to Nahum chapter 3, we can see another rebuke of Nineveh, and it begins this way. Woe to the city of blood. City of blood, that's a charming nickname, isn't it? Nahum describes it as a city filled with lies and deceit and theft, that there's no end to the predatory nature of the people. The people can't even walk around because they inevitably stumble trying to wade through the piles of its victims. Nineveh's, insa Nineveh's insatiable greed is compared to a prostitute who entices her victims with her charms, but in her wake leaves them trapped and spoiled. Honestly, Nineveh doesn't sound like the kind of place I want to go to either, especially if it's to rebuke the entire city for their evil ways, which apparently was great. Nineveh, after all, was one of the largest of the ancient cities, over 100,000 inhabitants. 
It could be difficult enough to rebuke a single person who is guilty of committing sinful activity, but collectively calling out over 120,000 people who live in the city of blood, I think that sounds a little too dangerous for any one man to take up alone. But Jonah wouldn't be alone. He would have God on his side. But more on that later, too. In chapter 2 of Jonah, we finally get to Jonah's prayer of repentance, given while still in the belly of the fish. It's a really beautiful prayer, and it reads something like this. When I was in trouble, I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me. From the belly of the grave I called out, and you heard me. You threw me into the depths, into the heart of the sea, and the floodwaters surrounded me. Your waves and billows covered me. I thought you have driven me from your sight, and yet I long to again look upon your holy temple. Yes, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The weeds bound me like shackles in the depths of the sea, down to the lowest parts of the earth. Earth's prison bars closed around me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. You gave me life again. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. For mercy is not found in worthless idols. So I sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving, and I will keep my vow, for salvation only comes from the Lord. After this, the Lord speaks to the fish, and it vomits Jonah out on the dry land. I find the structure of the book of Jonah to be pretty sophisticated, to be honest. So in chapter 1, as I mentioned, we're asked to compare the mariners to Jonah. But in chapter 3, we get a repetition of God's call for Jonah to go to Nineveh. And that encourages us to compare the two responses of Jonah. In chapter 1, of course, Jonah runs away from his obligations. But in chapter 3, it says, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. This is a pretty amazing story, isn't it? We start out, Jonah is given a command from the Lord, which he refuses to obey. The consequences of those actions cause Jonah to realize that he is in the wrong, and so he vows to repent of his error. So God commands Jonah a second time, and because of his repentance, Jonah obeys. Now, what are the results of Jonah's obedience? Well, Jonah goes to rebuke Nineveh. And the people of Nineveh unexpectedly all repent. Did you get that? The whole city repents. The city of blood calls out to God for forgiveness. And they vow to turn from their evil ways and the violence of their hands. God sees Nineveh's remorse, how they've turned from their evil way, and he gives them a second chance. So these three chapters create a beautiful triptych. It's a perfect three-part story that has symmetry on two different levels. We have one, Jonah and Nineveh are both disobedient to God. Two, they both repent. Three, they are both spared from destruction and given a second chance. So the book of Jonah illustrates that God is gracious and long-suffering, that he doesn't want anybody to perish, and that even during the time of the old law, the Lord was not just the God of the Jews, he was the God of the whole world. And the centerpiece of this story is Jonah's prayer of repentance in chapter 2. So let's look at this prayer a little closer. Now the, there's a handout that I provided, I don't know if there are any more back there. But uh, on the handout, on one side, the landscape-oriented side, I've given you the English Standard Version uh, rendering of the prayer. In trying to analyze this prayer, I noticed a lot of striking similarities to other prayers and psalms in the Old Testament. We don't have time now, but I will invite you on your own time to compare all of Jonah's prayer with, uh, down here it says, see also Psalm 88, Psalm 107, and Lamentations 3. Compare the entire prayer to those other three. 
But since we don't have time to do all that, I do want us to look at a few of the references and quotations that Jonah makes to various psalms that I've found. And I've listed them as footnotes on the bottom of the handout. So let's look at the very first verse here, the very first phrase of the first verse. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. That's the first footnote is Psalm 18.6, which says, In my distress I called upon the Lord. To my God I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. You hear some similarities, I think, between those two. Let's look at verse 3. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Compare that to Psalm 42, verse 7. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Again, pretty similar. Look at verse 4. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. Compare that to Psalm 31. I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Uh, let's skip down to uh, verse 8. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. This is kind of a combination of two of them, Psalm 31 and 147. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. And But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Now look at the last verse, verse 9 of the, poem, of the uh, prayer. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Again, this is a combination of two different psalm verses. Uh, psalm 50, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the Most High. And Psalm 3, salvation belongs to the Lord. I went through those rather quickly. I hope the point, at least, is made that this whole prayer is like a mosaic of all of these different psalms where miscellaneous phrases and ideas are being pieced together to create a new psalm. Is Jonah allowed to do that? Are we allowed to do that? Some of you are probably instinctively thinking, well, that's kind of a cheap way to come up with a prayer, all right? I mean, isn't that plagiarism? Well, I, I believe that uh, a wonderful way to learn something is to imitate someone who knows how to do it. Okay, Most of us learn this way. It's the master and apprentice relationship. So if I needed to write a psalm, I'm going to study and model my psalm after someone that I think is worthy of imitation. And I'm going to pick a psalm that I think I can learn something from that will help me to express the depth of feeling that I'm hoping to communicate. Think about it this way. What were the Psalms for in the Old Testament? How were they used? Well, they were placed in the sanctuary. The Levitical choirs would use them during the services, but also for individuals to use in whatever way was needed or fitting. Do you want to praise God? Use Psalm 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Or maybe you did that one already this week. Maybe you need Psalm 32. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Maybe you need help to create a pious and a productive life. Well, guess what? There's a psalm for that. Maybe you need to repent. There's a psalm for that. Only Jonah didn't use just one psalm when he needed to repent. He references and quotes a lot of them. So in a way, this is far more sophisticated than just simply reciting a single psalm. Jonah customized it for, well, let's face it, it's a pretty unique situation that Jonah found himself in. It's kind of like a uh, patchwork quilt. If you do it with care, the results are beautiful. They're useful. They're meaningful. After all, the results speak for themselves, don't they? It worked for Jonah. He repented. He was delivered. And his preaching was successful, wasn't it? You have a comment?
apostles themselves even asked Christ to teach them to pray. And of course, with Jonah being a Hebrew, he would have been very familiar with the scriptures. So what better invitation to follow than our scripture book that we have? Amen. All right. I agree with that 100%. So was Jonah successful? Yes. But we're not done with the story of Jonah. There's a fourth chapter. So if you didn't like Jonah very much in chapter 1, you'll probably like him even less in chapter 4. When Jonah goes to Nineveh in chapter 3, Nineveh is described as being a large city. Three days across is a journey to get around the city. But it says that Jonah only goes a one day's journey preaching. I never noticed that before, but as, as effective as his preaching was, it seems a little half-hearted that he only went a third through it. Well, why wasn't Jonah willing to continue preaching to the rest of the city? We find out in chapter 4 why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place. It was because Jonah didn't want Nineveh to have the opportunity to be saved. He wanted the wrath of God to wipe them off the face of the earth. So after a busy day of rebuking all of his enemies, Jonah goes outside the city and sits to watch the city be destroyed. At least that's what he hopes. Maybe God should have just turned him into a pillar of salt right then and there, but instead he raises up a shade plant to cover him during the hot, scorching sun. And when Jonah finally realizes God is not going to kill them, he's going to spare Nineveh, it makes him furious. And he says to God, this is why I didn't want to come here in the first place. I knew you would be gracious and merciful to these people, that your steadfast love would prevent their destruction. So please just kill me already. I would rather die than live in a world where these people are shown pity. So it wasn't because Jonah, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he feared for his life. He did not want Nineveh to be saved. He didn't want them to have God's pardon. Now, if we had time, it would be interesting to compare Jonah's desire for Nineveh's annihilation to Abraham's plea for Sodom to be spared in Genesis chapter 18. It is incredibly different from one another. But instead of smiting the Ninevites, God chooses to destroy the plant that served as his shade. And how does Jonah react to that? The same childish way. Ah, oh, the sun is so hot. Now you've taken my shade. It's better for me to just die. I've got no reason left to live. Jonah has the audacity here to pity the plant. It was lifted up in a day and it was destroyed in a day. But he doesn't take the time to consider that God should have pity for this ancient city of Nineveh. Over 120,000 people in this city. And yeah, Nineveh's old. Its founding is mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. And so after all of this goes down, we're not told Jonah's response. Instead, we're left to determine how we will answer this question. Will we be like Jonah? Will we take as much grace and forgiveness offered to us, but deny that same favor to others? I recently read a book about the person who is probably the most contested Christian conversion since Saul of Tarsus, and I even think he may have Saul beat. Serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeff didn't just kill 17 men. He had sex with them before and after the murders. He dismembered them. He cannibalized them. He even preserved parts of them for later. And while most people were in shock in the early 90s, trying to cope with the horrific nature and extent of these brutal crimes, there was a member of the church that looked at Jeff's story and said, there's a man that needs the grace of God. After completing several Bible correspondence courses, Jeff made the request to be baptized for the remission of his sins. The author of this book, Roy Ratcliffe, he's a preacher at a nearby Church of Christ, met with Jeff studied the Bible with Jeff, 
and finding no reason to deny him salvation in Christ Jesus, baptized him in the maximum security prison's medical bathing tub. Roy continued to study with Jeff until one day a fellow prisoner bludgeoned him to death with a weightlifting bar from the gym. But near the end of this book, Roy writes the following. One of the most common questions put to me about Jeff has to do with the sincerity of his faith. And I usually hear this from Christians. The people asking me didn't know about his post-baptismal life. They were basing their question on what he did before he was baptized, not after. Jeff was judged not by his faith, but by his crimes. The subtext of such questions were simple. They didn't want to think of Jeff as a brother. Such ungraciousness is contrary to the Christian spirit. Was Jeff saved? Were his sins taken away? Was he a Christian believer? Did he repent of his sins? Or was the blood of Christ shed on the cross somehow too weak, too thin, and too anemic to cover his sins? As I made my way through this thought-provoking book, I began to realize that if the blood of Christ doesn't have the power to cover Jeff's sins, what makes me so arrogant to think that it has the power to cleanse mine? Sadly, in response to the news that convicted serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer was baptized for the remission of sins, Roy reports that some people said this, if Dahmer goes to heaven, I don't want to go there. How foolish, how foolish. But isn't that essentially what Jonah said? I don't want to live if those people are going to be shown mercy. But when Jonah was shown mercy, he was all right with that, wasn't he? I think Jonah's problem was that he didn't appreciate his forgiveness enough to realize that the Ninevites, although they didn't deserve God's compassion, Jonah didn't deserve it either. But luckily, God's grace isn't a zero-sum game. If you gain forgiveness of your sins, it doesn't mean I can't receive it as well. So no, I don't, I don't think there was anything wrong with Jonah's prayer in chapter 2. But what I do take away from its construction and its reliance on the Psalms is that having the capability of quoting Scripture doesn't guarantee you that you know it or that you're living it. I think most of us can spot the difference between a reading of Scripture that is filled with understanding and one that seems empty. The right words may be there, but its meaning and importance seems to be missing or the concepts just don't seem to resonate with the reader. And I think furthermore, crafting a beautiful sounding prayer doesn't make it more genuine or sincere. But I don't think that means that we shouldn't try to achieve both. Can a beautifully written prayer not also be true and genuine? So for the remainder of our time tonight, I'm going to uh, offer you a different way of using the Psalms as was mentioned ago, a little bit ago, Jesus provided a model prayer for his disciples. And so we're going to do something very similar, but use what I think is probably the most powerful psalm of repentance. That's Psalm 51. It's going to be our model for us to create our own psalm or our own prayer of repentance. And I would like to conclude our service tonight by stating the prayer I composed based on Psalm 51. So I'm not sure who's running the stream, but I don't see any reason to cut it off tonight. Uh, if you deem so, you can do what you will. The methodology that I would like to do is pretty simple. I want to analyze the psalm. I want to think about each thought. I want to think about each phrase and, if necessary, each word. And then rewrite the psalm in our own words to describe our understanding, our interpretation of what the psalm means. Now, in some cases, it just means we're going to restate what's being said in our own words. It's almost like making our own translation of the text. In other cases, we're going to have to focus on interpreting the meaning and try to clarify our reading of what might otherwise be considered a, a kind of confusing language. In less frequent cases, we will need to update the psalm and what I mean by that is there are certain descriptions of temple worship, like burnt offerings and things, that I think will need to be revised to reflect the worship practices found in the New Covenant. Now, on the other side of tonight's um, handout, I've given you an analysis and a breakdown of Psalm 51. Now, if this was a different setting, mostly if we had fewer people and a whole lot more time, 
I would be totally up for breaking this entire page down in excruciating detail, but I also know that that makes for a rather mind-numbing class. Um, so we're going to be very selective tonight and only do a few key places within the psalm to show the concepts that I'm talking about for this process. So let's start at what's described here as the introductory petition. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. The first key word I see is mercy, so God's mercy. But I also notice that there are three, uh, three terms that are just in this first verse that all seem related to each other. God's mercy, God's steadfast love, and God's abundant mercy. So take note of those three belong together. Similarly, I see that we have the word transgressions at the end of verse 1, and we have three terms all together that seem related. Transgressions, iniquity, and sin. Now, a lot of people obsess over terms like this, and they think that each one of them represents some very specific uh, faction of general wrongdoing, and it's necessary, it's critical that we distinguish each kind very, very carefully, but I don't really find that to be the point of, of this. I don't think it's meant to be taken that literally most of the time. Um, these are often referred to as parallelisms, and I think their primary goal here is to create emphasis, and it's to offer us a deeper kind of three-dimensional view at it, approaching it from different angles. That's at least the way I look at it. Your mileage may vary, and you can do it however you prefer, but this is my approach on it. I also see that there are three ways that are described to get rid of our sins. It has to blot out, to wash me, and cleanse me. Those all mean pretty much the same thing. So now my goal here is to discover new ways to describe what these verses say, only in my own words. Now, in reality, I say my own words, I use a lot of resources here. I used a lot of tools. I used thesauruses, looking up synonyms for things. I looked at a dozen or more different translations of this psalm to see how it rendered it, and I made lists. So, for example, can you think of any other words that might have similar meaning to mercy, steadfast love, abundant mercy? Can you think of anything that would be Maybe it's in the Bible somewhere else, and you're like, oh, I've always liked this rendering of that concept. The word grace. Grace. There's you a good one. Compassion. Pity. Anybody got any more? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Beautiful. What else? God's tenderness, his loving kindness. I really like that one, loving kindness. Yeah, there's lots of them. Okay, And I just went through and I picked out all of the ones that I liked. I was not discretionary other than, oh, that sounds nice. Oh, I like that one. Oh, I, oh, I've heard that one before. That one reminds me of this. And so I just wrote down the ones that appealed to me. But what about uh, some others? Transgressions, iniquity, and sin. Can you think of any other words that resemble the meaning of those? How about our offenses? Failures, yes. Anything else? Guilt. Guilt, our wickedness, our immorality. There's a lot of things that we could use for that. What about uh, the blotting out or washing or cleansing? Can you think of anything there? Forgiveness, Forgiveness yeah, or just even forgetting. That's often used in the Psalms. What else? Purify, good, good. Cleansing. Cleansing, yeah. Wipe away, hide, conceal. All of these are very good. Now, once I had a list of all of these, it's like, okay, can we combine these and create something that's appealing in different ways? Well, we could ask for God's grace. We can ask God to wipe away our offenses. We can say, Purify my wickedness. Erase my faults through your loving kindness. There's all sorts of ways that we can combine them. Now, why do this? What is the point of this? I don't know if you fall into this category, but if I just read what someone else wrote, it's easy for me to just glance through it, especially when it repeats itself over and over again in these parallelisms. I kind of get lost in it. I'm like, okay, okay, got it, got it, got it, got it. 
but I don't take the time to dwell in it very much. And so this helps make it more personal to me because I'm making decisions of how I want this to be expressed. How am I choosing what to say? Well, I'm basing it on many things. I can base it on sound. I can base it on, when I say it aloud, what it sounds like. I can also base it on, how does it make me feel when I put those words together? Does it draw me in? Does it gain my attention? Is it memorable? Okay, these are things that are, are causing me to choose what I'm going to do for that. All right, so I think the opening section is kind of straightforward. You're just restating what's there. Let's look at something that's a little bit more challenging in section two. This is the confession section of this psalm. I think both verses four and five cause a little bit of problems. Look at verse four. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Is that true? Did David only sin against God? Isn't this supposed to be where he raped Bathsheba and he killed her husband? I don't think I would classify that as only sinning against God. So what is going on here? What does he mean by that? Why does he say it that way? Yes, he did transgress God's law. And that's the point he's trying to emphasize, isn't it? Because this is not a prayer to the other people. This is a prayer to God. He's focusing on his relationship to God, who he has wronged. Yeah? So my interpretation of this is God is just in his condemnation of me because I sinned against him. I think that's what it means. Is that what David meant? I think so. But here's the beauty part of this. It doesn't actually matter. Okay? It doesn't matter. I'm not trying to fix this psalm. I'm not trying to replace this psalm. What I'm using this psalm for is I'm using it as an influence, a guide for my own thoughts. Okay, I'm trying to, my goal anyway for using David's psalm here is to prompt me towards deeper thoughts, thoughts that I normally don't think about when I'm praying. And so by taking what he says, even if I don't understand it completely, if it spurs a thought and I go, oh, that's, I hadn't thought about that. Well, now I've gained something that I didn't have before. And so that's my goal here. Uh, look, look at verse 5. This is equally challenging. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. If you take that verse literally, and unfortunately many have, it kind of sounds like we're born into the world as sinners. But there's plenty of other verses that say that that's not the case. So what is David saying? Why does he say it that way? Again, it's poetic. It's not literal. So what's he trying to express here? Absolutely. But I think the emphasis here is that he is so undeserving of God's grace because to him, he's like, I can't even remember when I was righteous. From my birth, not literally, but his entire life, he has been sinning. He is unworthy. That's what I believe he's, he's focusing on here. Uh, drop down to uh, verses 16 and 17. Here we have references to the Old Testament temple worships with sacrifices, burnt offerings, and that kind of thing. Um, just in short, I think the main point of these passages is that God is not pleased with outward actions of obedience when there are inward problems in our lives. Okay? That's what I'm going to focus on for those particular verses. I think that's a, a better fit. All right, and then we get to the epilogue. Now, there's some people who think that these two verses don't even belong to this psalm, but they're here, so we're going to try to include them. This epilogue speaks first of Zion. Well, Zion has a lot of connotations to it. It could be Israel as a whole. It could be referencing Jerusalem itself, or it could be talking about the temple specifically. Also, we have something about the walls of Jerusalem, and then we have a whole bunch about temple worship again. Now, I personally don't have any desire to pray about Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, or Old Testament worship in my prayer of repentance. It seems oddly out of place to do that. So if I'm going to adapt this prayer, I need to try to think of something that's going to be more appropriate. So for Zion, I'm thinking, okay, in Hebrews 12, it refers to Zion as a heavenly Jerusalem. So we could make the kingdom of God connection back to the church. That works for me. 
Now, so the building up of the walls of Jerusalem become building up the walls, the defenses of the church, helping the church be strong and helping it be protected from the evil outside it. Then this last verse becomes that God is now going to be acceptant of our proper acts of worship in the church when our heart is right. That's the way that I'm going to adapt that to fit something that seems more fitting to what my goal is. So having completed this task myself, I want to provide you with a couple of takeaways that I gained from it. Initially, my goal was simply to create a prayer. I was focused on the end result. That's what I was trying to do. You've probably heard this, the, the adage, it's not the destination, it's the journey. Well, that turned out to be absolutely true as I worked on this. The, the few hours I spent on this Saturday um, trying to reproduce Psalm 51, it started out just as a mental exercise for me. Like the first couple of verses, trying to think of ways to restate something that was already there. But less than halfway in there, it resulted in affecting my heart quite deeply. Uh, I'm not actually sure if I'd ever experienced that feeling of humility and tenderness as I did when I was working on that. I mean, it was kind of remarkable. I was incredibly focused and I was just really into what I was trying to do because the process just revealed itself as I was trying to work through that. I mean, I've wondered for a long time, what could I do to improve my prayers, to make them more meaningful for me and not repetitive? And as mentioned, I can't think of a better guide than the man after God's own heart. Okay, there's a reason that he devoted himself so much to these and provided them for all of us to gain from his experience. So, um, if you will, please bow with me and we will, I will recite this prayer and I hope that it will rejuvenate your interest in the Psalms and maybe encourage you to find similar ways to deepen your prayer life as this has for mine. <clears throat> o oh God, my Father in heaven, show me your loving kindness. Have pity on me, Lord, and in keeping with your boundless love and compassion, forgive me of my evil ways. Wipe away my offenses and wash me of my wickedness. My offenses are very clear to me, Lord, and my guilt continuously worries me. Because of my transgressions, I deserve your condemnation. I have broken your will, my God, and my sin is ultimately against you. There's never been a time when I was deserving of your salvation, no part of my life when I could boast in my own righteousness. Yet, you, Father, desire that I act with integrity and with an honest heart seek out what is right. So let me again drink from the pure waters of life. Cleanse me from the stains of vileness and immorality. Make me whole again. My soul is broken, Lord, because of my sin, and now my heart longs to rejoice. Turn your eyes from my wickedness and remember my sins no more. Help me to be pure in heart, O God. Guide me in the ways of faithfulness. Do not reject me as I rejected you but restore your covenant with me as I return to you. For I long to again delight in your deliverance. Instill within me a desire to endure in my obedience to your will. Use my life as an example of repentance to others so that if the greatness of my sins can be forgiven, others can find hope as well. Keep me from resentment and retaliation. Instead, Supply me opportunities to sing and praise your holy name. And I will not worship you with only outward observances. No, I will not be a mere facade of obedience. For superficial compliance is inadequate service to you, O Lord. For I will serve you from my entire being, beginning with a submissive heart. I am humbled by the deep sorrow of my iniquities, Lord, and I offer to you my spirit, eager to be once again cast and molded in your image. Show favor to your church, my God, by strengthening us from those who oppose your will, 
For it is only when we conform to your will and do what is right in your sight, O Lord, that you will accept our worship. And we long to worship you, Lord. It's in your Son's holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.